if people are interested in where we are. So if you don't know us, we live in a 1770 house on Main Street in Woodbury, and we're actually in my son, Eris's brother's mixed um, bedroom. He went to the University of Puerto Rico. He loved it so much that he stayed there, but we thought this is just the perfect setting for, for some of our talks, some of our ones that are more historical. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are. So should we start? Mm -hmm. Okay, so my name's Velia. Um, I'm an author, I'm a teacher, public speaker. I call myself an expert on herstory unsanitized, because I do this pretty popular talk called The Not-So-Good Life of the Colonial Good Wife, and I want to do it again in real life, how women dealt with sex, menstruation, birth control, stuff like that. This is my daughter, Eris. And I'm an herbalist and green witch and author and holistic nutritionist. So people kind of know me as the Colonial Good Wife, and Eris used to own Grounded Holistic Wellness. So about three years ago, we joined forces, and now we call ourselves Grounded Good Wife, and we teach a whole bunch of hands-on holistic workshops, normally in real life, and herstory on sanitized presentations. Mm -hmm. We thought we'd share some highlights from some of our Zoom presentations. By the 1860s, it was common for corsets to be boned with as many as blank whale bones. Some corsets of the era had over blank bones in them. So we're looking for two numbers, and those numbers are 60 and 100. Like that, that was, that's shocking. Um, I think most people know that the corsets actually, they weren't, they didn't use whalebone. What they used was something called baleen. And what baleen is, it's these hairy kind of combs that hang down from the jaws of whales and they use it to filter critters from the sea. And baleen is very springy and tough. The bad part about this whole thing is by the 1860s, whalers weren't going out for whales for the blubber because by then we were using kerosene, but they were going out for the whales, hacking the baleen out of their mouths and then just chucking them back in the ocean. So like obviously that helped decimate the whale population. But to me, when you think about it, like for to make corsets out of it, let's just like, oh, that one gets me very upset, that question. So moving on to the Tudor period. So that covers 1485 to 1603. So that's the reigns of Henry VII. Henry VIII, Edward VI, Mary I, and Elizabeth I. And if you know anything about your history, you know at this point in history, it was pretty important to keep one's head, right? So now Harris is gonna put on something called a bum roll. So I'm gonna switch back over to real life here. So here's the bum roll. So it's like a padded roll. Right. <laughs> I just like I'm putting on a life jacket or one of those floaty things when I put this on. It does. So she can put it on, she'll model it for you, then I'll talk about it a little bit. So this is the bum roll. It would have worn over the corset just like that. So the purpose of the bum roll was to make your waist appear artificially small and your hips and bum oversized, which meant that you were good for childbearing. Now, every time Eris and I do research where a woman is demeaned or women are seen as sex objects, we always say, what do we say, Eris? Blech. blech. So you're going to see there's a lot of blechting in this talk, and we hope by the time it ends that you're joining in and blessing with us. <laughs> so Eris, is it impossible? It's impossible to relax in that thing, isn't it? Yeah, so of course in real life you would have a dress on over this, and you couldn't just have your hands down by your sides. So you'd have to kind of keep your hands up like this the whole time and kind of rest them on the bum roll, which for a few minutes, it's like, yeah, whatever, not a big deal. But all day, imagine your hands up, your shoulders kind of tense, like that would be kind of unpleasant all day, every day. Right. So if you look at, at a portrait from this era, when you see women like that, that's exactly why their hands were like that. And we're re we were rewatching Turn, you know, the, the um, American Revolution spy thing on, what's that on? AMC. AMC. And so many of the women, they walked around like that. And that's exactly the reason. So Eris is now going to take off her bum roll and put on a farthingale. So we're gonna, I'm gonna pass her the farthingale. We have props hidden all over this room. So here's a farthingale, which always seems like I'm stepping into a paper plate when I put up this thing on. <laughs> so that's that. This one I gotta say, it's like, well, it's, it's sort of cute. It think? looks kind of cool. Yeah. So the farthingale, so the deal was there were two types. So one gave the cone effect and one got, gave the tabletop effect. And that's what, the, that's what this one is, the tabletop effect. So the point of this one was to show that you had big hips, which meant that you were a good breeder, to which we say, blech. Blech. exactly. So this one, you couldn't have your hands down by your sides because it wouldn't be this bendy. This is just a more modern one that's a little bit flexible, mm -hmm. but it would have been kind of stiff in real life. So you'd have to have your hands up and it's kind of worse than the bum roll because the bum roll you have kind of the bum roll to rest your arms on a bit but this one there's like nothing there so that would have been kind of uncomfortable after a while i think so yeah yeah 
So it was, and obviously it would have been kind of hard to sit down. Well, so yeah, absolutely. Dude, right. had a dress on over that, and this was much, 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 much more stiff. So it was alleged that Queen Joan of Portugal was the one that popularized the farthingale, and she wore it to hide an illegitimate pregnancy. So the court gossip added to the whole popularity of this whole thing, and the you know the gossip over the illegitimate pregnancy. So Eric's is going to put on something called a crinoline. So give us a sec. As you can see, we have these props like hidden all over the room. So, so here's the crinoline. This one I think is actually kind of, I, I wouldn't want to wear one, but I think it's kind of pretty. It's kind of fun to wear, at least for a short time. <laughs> so next up is the Edwardian era, a pretty short time from 1901 to 1910. So this was one last attempt at reining women in was something called the hobble skirt. And I think we're going to say that this was the stupidest fashion of all. Wouldn't yes. You, don't you agree? Okay. So things were, keep in mind, things were just getting better for women when this stupid hobble skirt came to be. So I tell the story of how it happened. Mm -hmm. So in, um, so some woman, she went on a plane ride with Wilbur Wright in 1908. doesn't matter what, what her name was. So her skirts, her dress started billowing. So what she did, she tied a rope around her knees to keep the skirt from billowing during the plane ride. So when she got out of the plane, she forgot to take the rope off. Someone saw her and they were like, oh my gosh, what a great fashion. So that's how the dopey hobble skirt was born. Sorry, she wants to explain this one. So it would have been like a normal looking dress or skirt, but around the ankles it, or knees, kind of between ankles and knees, it would have had some kind of, like not really tie, but some kind of thing that really inhibited your walking. Like a very, you know, we'll, we'll show you photos, but a very, a uh, big piece of ribbon. So yeah, so ex explain this top. Of, so you can just, see like this is the best I can do with walking right now. So it really does make you hobble. Very restrictive. Yeah. yeah. At this point in our talk, what we do, we would have volunteers come up, it come, come up and we had four hobble skirts. So we would have them put the hobble skirts on. Then we used to play Alexander's Ragtime Band because that was a popular song then. And we used to hop, have a hobble skirt relay race. Tell them our, our best story about this one. We had one um, in Massachusetts. We're at some mansion. Months ago. Yeah. And there are two people were in our relay race and they were on a date actually it was the guy their first the date right yeah yeah it was their first date so we thought the guy was pretty cool yeah the guy put on the hobble skirt he yeah. left that part out yeah so that's pretty good so yeah we so, always say we usually attract women to our audiences but when we, have, when we have men they're always very cool men yeah so we're going to show you a few hobble dress examples so they are pretty they're pretty like yeah. nice designs but imagine that thing around your around your knees like ugh. So we've all heard about the force feeding that suffragettes endured, but we didn't realize how bad it actually was. So we found some actual uh, firsthand accounts of what, they, what the women went through. And once again, we're not speaking only about ones in United, suffragettes in the United States. There's some women we can talk about in the United Kingdom and also some in Australia. The first one's a quote by Lady Constance Bulwer Lytton. You can't breathe yet you choke. Every second seems an hour and you think they'll never finish pushing it down. Then the food is poured and again you choke and your whole body resists. So her treatment caused a heart attack and a stroke and she died in 1923. And while she was in jail, she carved a V, which was the votes for women symbol on her breast with a hairpin. And we're gonna end, end with this because I just think stuff like this, this is interesting. Did you ever wonder why almost every bra you've ever owned has that little small bow you know, stitched between the two front cups? That's because in the 15 and 1600s, women wore something called a stomacher or a stay busk. And it sort of looked like um, a paint stirrer stick with two holes at the top, and they slid it down the front of their corset to kind of keep it um, firm. Then it had two holes at the top, and that ribbon went through there and, and tied. So really, the, the little ribbon that's on bras today, it's just a holdover from those stomach or stay bus. <laughs> I do remember wearing a gara belt and the really? other thing for the, uh, uh, for the pads. Oh, you, oh really? You were, yes. yes. But I, I must I have do as well. That I must have been very. I that was on on the seventies. I came to this country. Oh wow! Nineteen seventy one, and that was uh, they were selling those. Really? I wore I wore one as well as a teenager. I was in fourth grade when I got my menstruation, and I was wearing that in fourth grade. This, I think, is one of my favorites. <laughs> the permanent magical cure for bedwetting was to take the child to the churchyard and have him or her urinate upon the grave of a child of the opposite sex. Or give the child fried, roasted, boiled, or stewed mice. Okay, the worst one. It really, really is. Aris, 
honestly, she'll, you probably see a tear roll out of Eris's eye for this one because she really does. So to cure gout, she must take a roast, a roast a fat old goose and stuff with lard, incense, wax, flour of rye, and chopped kittens. This must all be eaten and the dripping applied to the painful joints. Like, I think I would rather have gout than have to chop up kittens. That's so sad. I, I, how, how we even came up with this? I know. I can't, even, I can't even picture that. I know. That's a bad one. Yeah, that's bad. Back to snails. So for centuries, snails have been considered one of the best remedies for colds and coughs and sore throats. And there was a doctor from 1728 who had a nice quote about snails. He said, they abound with a slimy juice and are very good in weakness and consumption, especially for children and tender constitutions. And he had a recipe to make a snail syrup. <laughs> to make a syrup of snails, take garden snails early in the morning when the dew is upon them, one pound, take off their shells, slit them, and with half a pound of sugar, put them in a bag. Hang them in a cellar and the syrup will melt and drop through, which keep for use. It possesses in the best manner all the virtues of snails. I was Yum. We have a creepy, like, old dirt floor basement. <laughs> a million spiders. I'm just picturing a, sn a snail bag. Oh, a pound of snails. snail bag uh, hanging up. Uh, ah! yeah. I would be surprised if we found one down there. So we're thinking that they mean those floater things. I don't really know what that feels like. I've never had that. But I guess they, those kind of feel like cobwebs or specks that kind of float around in your field of vision. So the remedy was, when going to bed, put a little earwax on the speck. This has cured many. So we found, this, was, this was interesting. We too. found a really weird study for this one. So researchers collected- this is modern day. Yeah. yeah. Researchers collected cerumen, which is a fancy word for earwax, with a sterile earwax hook, which I don't even know is a thing, from 12 people. They mixed it all together in like, I guess a Petri dish kind of thing. Then they introduced some bacteria to it. So they, I guess they had like little separate petri dishes of the, the earwax. Right. So the earwax actually managed to kill off 99% of the bacteria strains, including H. influenza, some strains of E. coli, and some strep and staph. So the earwax actually had bactericidal effects on all the 10 types of bacteria that they tested and prevented bacteria and fungi from growing. So, so remember we talked about celandine when we talked about ringworm? Here's like a really interesting celandine stuff we discovered. Yeah. Like, if you have celandine, man, you're upset. <laughs> Go ahead, tell us, tell us up. So there's been over 200 modern day studies of celandine. There was one where they had three groups of people. They were, had patients with cholangitis, which is infection of the bile duct, inflammation of the gallbladder with gallstones, and then inflammation of the gallbladder without gallstones. So they gave celandine to all these people, and over two thirds of them had good or very good results. So that's pretty cool. You know, I should say, like I've never, I never really talked about this before, but my brother, when he was thirty years old, he had a liver transplant. He's fine, but he there's nothing wrong with his liver. What he had was um, sclerosing cholangitis, which was an effect, you know, scarring of the bile duct. So I often wonder, since I read this, I wonder if celandine could have helped him and maybe could have prevented the whole liver transplant than having to take the you know cyclosporin for the rest of his life. So imagine, mm -hmm. imagine if that could have fixed it. So. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Another one, celandine combined with thistle was shown to increase bile flow and secretions from the pancreas. This is a placebo-controlled trial. Another one where they tested the celandine on chronic bronchitis, and they gave people a celandine extract, and it had an 80% success rate, which is pretty amazing. And there's a case of whooping cough where they tested 500 kids, and they were infants and children. They gave celandine syrup to all the infants and the kids and it cured 71%, and then another 23% had a major improvement. So until recently, traditionally ferment, culture to fermented foods were things like ketchup, sauerkraut, pickles, soy sauce, cod liver oil, Tabasco sauce, Worcestershire sauce, yogurt, some cheeses, and sour cream. So today at supermarkets, you really just, if you buy the supermarkets, you're really just eating pickled or processed virgin, versions of traditionally fermented or cultured foods. So if you think about it, unless you're really, really making a conscientious effort, um, the average American is eating very little, if any, fermented foods. We're gonna teach you how to make two recipes. We're gonna teach you how to make a ginger ale and also some vanilla and almond extract. And these are all things that I think people are kind of like um, surprised and like mildly blown away that they can make them themselves. Because I don't know, they just seem like 
people just think they're like such mysterious recipes. You can, there's no way you can make them yourself, but right. they're pretty easy. And also we chose these. I think, I think people sometimes think, oh, ginger ale, how nice. Oh, I'm an extract, how nice. But really we chose these because they actually have medicinal benefits. You're gonna see the ginger ale is very probiotic and vanilla extract, the real kind, like you're gonna make with us, really does have medicinal benefits. And that's really, we didn't just randomly pick these two recipes. This mm -hmm. is ones that we, are, that we use in our own lives. So. so nobody knows totally for sure when ginger ale became a thing but it probably started out as a homemade drink in England and Ireland in the 1840s. So it really tasted nothing like modern day ginger ale. I'm sure you've all had some kind of store-bought ginger ale at some point that's all like bubbly and sweet. And this kind didn't really taste like that at all. Mm -hmm. It was more like um, sugar water with a little hint of ginger. So then it made its way across the Atlantic and came to the East Coast. It was becoming a pretty big thing in New York by the 1850s. So by 1860s, ginger ale developed into what we now call the golden style. So it was very sweet, had a bubbly texture um, with a really strong ginger punch. Now there's some conflicting info here, but a company named Verner's claims they were the first ones to actually commercially make ginger ale. But there's a funny story that goes along with this. It seems like every, everything has a story or a legend, <laughs> doesn't it? So the story goes that there was a pharmacist named James Verner and he left an experimental barrel of ginger ale in his barn in Philadelphia in 1862 before he went to join the Union Army. And then in 1866, four years later, he came back and he opened up the barrel and ta-da, the golden style of ginger ale was born. So we have a couple of comments about this, right? Well, I feel like if I were about to go join an army and join a war, one of the last things I would do would not be make a barrel of ginger ale. So I don't know about that. And also, I think his facial hair is a little much. Yeah. Could have used a trim. Yeah. So we always say when you hear about vanilla extract, I think most people think of desserts. Vanilla has a lot of medicinal benefits, and we thought we'd talk about some of the main ones. The, the main one is that vanilla is an antioxidant. But I think antioxidant is one of those words where it's really trendy. People are always throwing it around. People like Dr. Oz are always saying things are antioxidant. But I think it's like a buzzword and a lot of people don't really know what are you talking about when you talk about antioxidant. But I think Eris, in her herbal wisdom, has figured out a pretty pretty clear way to explain it, I think. I like what you say it. Thanks. You're welcome. So in today's world, it's pretty hard to avoid free radicals, which come from stuff like eating a lot of fried food, inhaling tobacco smoke, um, drinking a lot of alcohol, and also being around pesticides and chemicals. And those like, even if you're kind of, you live, like, pure lives, like we do. She we, says this, and we sound like a couple of nuns, don't we? Like, I mean, like, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't eat junk. We don't swear. We don't use any kind of pesticides or chemicals in, in our house we're, or Let's just outside. say we, we're kind of clean. We're not, like, pure. Well, well, you know what I mean. Yeah. But anyway, even if you're like us, <laughs> it's, you're not totally safe from these free radicals because even if you don't use any chemicals in your house or your yard, you might go outside and your neighbor just sprayed their trees or sprayed their lawn or sprayed like Roundup. So, and that's kind of getting into the, in, getting into the air, unfortunately. Right. So that free radical damage is also called oxidative stress. And that can cause some long lasting damage and diseases and just all kinds of health issues. So antioxidants are cool because they can like kind of block that free radical stuff from getting into your body or they slow down the damage that it can do to your cells and your body and just keep you in better health overall. But there's even a better reason to DIY your own vanilla, and that's because it's estimated that somewhere between 75 and 90% of vanilla extract that you find in stores, it isn't made with vanilla, it's made with something called lignin, which to me, that's a disgusting word. And what it is, it's a byproduct of paper waste products that they use to create synthetic vanilla. So lignin is actually made from leftover sawdust in paper mills. So if you look at your vanilla bottle, it's not gonna say lignin on there. Just like all those chemicals, they hide them under some kind of fake name. But um, there's a good, good, good chance if you didn't make it yourself that there's lignin in there. So here's where I take my life in my hands because I'm gonna hold this cutting board up by my throat Eris is gonna cut the vanilla bean with a knife. I'm pretty responsible cutting things like at normal level, but up this high, might be, I don't know. you could be seeing my final zoom <laughs> <laughs> presentation here. So. Okay, so you're just gonna just kind of slice it along the whole length of the pod because you want you don't want to. Martha Stewart doesn't go through this stuff. No, no. Okay. You don't want to put it in whole because the stuff that's really flavorful is the stuff in the middle. Right. So then, well, should we come clean and tell them the real thing? Yeah. Okay. So we're really into doing things obviously well in the right way, but not 
the annoying, complicated way that's kind of like... Like for instance, sense. for instance, um, with our kimchi class, we found a very easy way to make kimchi, where if you do, um, if you look at kimchi recipes, it's such a big drawn out process. Or Iris has really streamlined how to make kombucha. Or like for instance, our bone broth. You know, you're, really, you're supposed to cook bone broth for 72 hours. We figured out a way to do it in two hours, but you get all the medicinal benefits. And the reason we believe in doing stuff like that, that way is because the whole idea is you're supposed to be taking vanilla every day, kimchi or some kind of fermented thing every day, bone broth every day. But if it's like, ugh, I have to make the stupid vanilla or ugh, I have to make the bone broth, you're never going to keep it up and therefore you're not going to do it. So we just have figured out a way to streamline it where you're getting just as many medicinal benefits, but it's not making it crazy. 